you as an individual have a positive and negative element as well and that's the hero and the villain and of course what good is a story without a hero and a villain and the villain is the person who isn't acting like a person should act and the hero is the person who's acting like a person should act and so you go to movies and you read books and there's heroes and there's villains and to some degree what you're doing is you're fleshing out your notion of a villain you know, you read about 30 villains and you think, well, there's something villainous about the villains that's the central element of villainy, whatever that is and you could imagine you construct out a meta-villain and a meta-hero and those are the characters in religious stories, generally speaking you know, in, 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 in the Marvel movies there's Odin and Odin has two sons, right? Thor and Loki. Thor is like Thor is the world redeeming hero and Loki is the trickster who wants to bring everything down. And you have to recognize that in yourself. Or it's useful to because otherwise you underestimate. Is this positive study? No. It's maps of meaning. Positive psych. <laughs> it's definitely not that. <laughs> Why might you be villainous? Well, first of all, because you can be. That's a big deal. You can be. It's actually an offshoot of empathy. This is something that took me decades to figure out. I figured it out when I was studying the book of Genesis because in the book of Genesis people become self-conscious and they immediately have the knowledge of good and evil and I, I just couldn't figure that out, it's like what, what the hell is the relationship between that? and then really, I, I tell you, I thought about that like for 30 years trying to puzzle that out and then I realized what it was if you're self-conscious you can, you can conceptualize yourself as a being you know that you are and you know what you're like and you know what hurts you and what doesn't and as soon as you know what hurts you you know what hurts her and so that's the knowledge of good and evil that comes along with being self-conscious this is something that distinguishes human beings from every other animal you know, a lion will eat you but it doesn't really want to tear you apart slowly just for the fun of it well, it eats you, it just wants to eat you and, you know, you could call that evil, it sucks, that's for sure but animals are beyond good and evil in that sense but human beings, man, we can aim our malevolence and we're really good at it because we can imagine, God, this would hurt and if it hurts me, man, it's really going to hurt you so, and you need to know that you're like that because you are like that and if you don't know you're like that or if you don't think you're like that you're even more like that than you think because the people who are most like that are people who don't think they're like that at all and you have to contend with that and that's why in many systems of thinking the world is conceptualized as a battle between good and evil and it's an appropriate conceptualization it's a meta-conceptualization and the culture is the wise king and the tyrant and that's always the case and, and you're always stuck with that because as an individual with your negative side and your positive side your negative side is the resentful side that is irritated at the limited conditions of being and the suffering that entails and it's arbitrary and unfair nature and no wonder, like, you got that side has a case to make it's not trivial in, in the brothers Karamazov that argument is laid out beautifully, there's a character, Alyosha, who's a monk, monastery novitiate and not really a sparkling intellect, but a very good person and he has a brother, Ivan, and Ivan's a vicious genius and Ivan just takes Alyosha apart and partly he does that by telling a story about that Dostoevsky took this from a news story the news story was that this mother and father had taken their young daughter and locked her in the outhouse overnight when it was like 30 below and you know she stayed out there crying and screaming and froze to death and Ivan basically said to Alyosha you know a world in which that could happen should not be 
a good argument you know, and you can multiply that by millions of examples so the part of us that is opposed to being and resentful it's got a point, man the problem, as far as I can tell, is that if you act that out then it makes what you're objecting to worse now, you might be happy about that and you might think, well, people couldn't be consciously pursuing that, but yes, they can I would recommend a book called Pan's Ram and so, wherever you go, there's you and the half, two halves of you that you have to contend with and wherever you are with people, there's the society with its tyrannical and beneficial nature and the society in some sense is that match between what you're doing and what's happening it's really important to get that right and then unexplored territory, that's wherever and whenever what you're doing stops working and so, it's not exactly a geographical idea, you know, because when you think of explored territory you think of geographic landscape, like the, like the domain of an animal, you know, or like your house and, you know, that's that's definitely an element of it, but, you know, if you're in your house and a snake comes into your living room and you're in there, it's like, well that's an important difference between your house one second ago and your house now and so your house can turn into unexplored, unexplored territory at the drop of a hat, and that's because we live in space and time and so the unexplored territory is conceptual, it's a conceptual territory, and it's just wherever you are when things aren't working for you the way they're supposed to be and so, and these are permanent parts of the human experience which is why I think they are fundamental characters in our narratives there's always you there's some subject of the story and that subject is an ambivalent person with many different potentials and you're always somewhere and it's with other people because that's our territory, right? I mean, we're social beyond comprehension and, you know, even our primate ancestors, most of their territory was other primates and their brains and our brains are specialized to view the world as an aggregation of personalities it's really important to us and so, we tend to view the whole world that way and then, unexplored territory, well that's where you don't know what to do and, but, you know, you do know what to do when you don't know what to do peculiarly enough it's rather non-specific it's this generalized stress response and so what happens is you freeze, roughly speaking, if the threat is enough then you produce a lot of cortisol and a lot of adrenaline so that you're bloody well ready to move quick in whatever direction you have to and then, maybe you pay more attention and that's what you do when you don't know what to do and the problem with that is, is you can stay in that state forever, man that's kind of what post-traumatic stress disorder is it's like, you're just like that all the time and the problem with that is, it's very uncomfortable I mean, you stay like that for any length of time you're going to get depressed, you're going to develop an anxiety disorder you're going to get old because you're burning up resources like mad, you know, your system is shunting everything to maintain that state of emergency preparation and it's exhausting, it's, it's not where you want to be so, that's partly why people are so prone to defend their territories, their familiar territory because if their familiar territory is invaded or disrupted then they default back to this state of emergency preparation and that's like that can unglue you, if it's, if it's profound enough you know, and you guys know this already, I mean I think people experience this most particularly when they're betrayed by someone they have an intimate relationship with you know, when they're lied to there's other ways the collapse of a dream or a vision that you've been pursuing or an illness or the death in a family there's lots of other ways, but betrayal is a really good one because if you're with someone for a long time, you trust them, you have a representation of your past, you have a representation of you in the relationship, you have a representation of them, you have a representation of, re of relationships, you have a representation of the future you get betrayed, it's like poof! even the past isn't what you thought it was you know, and what about you? you know, how clueless are you? and maybe not at all, or maybe ultimately gullible, you don't know, is it your fault? 
or, you know, are you so clueless that you just can't protect yourself? Or was the person malevolent in some subtle way that you failed to detect? Everything's up in the air. Not good. And this idea that human beings travel to the underworld and come back is like, it's a really useful thing to understand because we do that all the time. Whenever we fail, it's like, whoop, down into the underworld for a while where everything's in chaos. And then maybe we sort ourselves out and bang, we're back up. And so, one way of conceptualizing yourself is not as order, and as not as chaos, but as the thing that traverses between the two domains. And that, I would say, is the mythological hero. You know, you might feel awe when you meet someone that you regard as particularly admirable as well, because you feel that there's something transcendent about them. So, here's an interesting thing to think about. There are people you admire. And there are people that you don't admire. And that's a clue, right? That's a clue as to your value system. And it, it might be not really something you can even put your finger on. It's like you, you find this person captivating, you find this person admi admirable. And it's, it's as if there's something inside of you that's looking for what's admirable. You know, assuming that you are. And that person who's admirable has a, has a faculty, some faculty, that you would like to have for yourself. And so they're a model for emulation. And that's part of how pe people develop, you know, like little kids often develop little hero crushes on older kids. You know, not that much older, but sort of the, the person that's sort of just within their grasp, and then they follow them around and imitate them, and, you know. So they're imitating what they find admirable. Well, the fact that you find something admirable is a hint as to the structure of your unconscious value system. And so, you could think even, as an exercise, you could think, well, what qualities of a human being do I find admirable? You have to ask yourself that, in a sense. You, ha you can't really think about it. There is a difference between asking yourself a question and thinking about it. You know, because it's more like when you're asking yourself a question, it's contemplative. It's like, well, what do I find admirable? It's a question. You don't know. And if you're fortunate, and this happens quite regularly, an answer will float up from wherever the hell answers float up, and, you know, oh yeah, that's one, and you can write that down. And, you get some idea of what your ideal is, you know, and you have one, likely, and what your counter-ideal is, 